So I guess some of this um, is different for each one of us based on how we came into the kingdom. And the American, uh, you know, a lot of the American evangelism was built on the idea that there's heaven and hell and you better accept Jesus because if you don't, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> and that wasn't how my wife and I came into the kingdom. We came in because we were really broken. You know, we were in a lot of pain it, separately. We didn't know each other when we got saved. But, you know, if you look back on our situations, that was really what drove me for sure. And, uh, and, and even in that emotional healing that we received and, and the deliverance from addictions that we both received, that was a form of healing, right? It's not just that cancer disappears or a limb grows back, which is awesome, and we want to see those things happen. It's also your total state of being, your, your decision-making processes and the ability to uh, walk away from something that you couldn't walk away from before with addictions. Um, so when you come in that way, then you expect that to keep on happening because that's the way you got in. And um, there was another man that was very influential on me named John Wimber. I know many of you have heard me say it, and he didn't get saved that way. He came in more on you know the uh, uh, traditional altar call, heaven and hell kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm not meaning to be critical. Any way people get in the kingdom is still good. But then he started reading the Bible, and uh, he's like, when do we get to do the stuff? <laughs> and, and they were saying, what do you mean, the stuff? What, what are you talking about? Well, when do we get to cast out demons? And when do we get to see people get healed? And, and the church that he was in was didn't really have a good answer for that. So, uh, you know, he brought it before the Lord. And you know, they kind of said, well, we don't have to actually do that. We just have to read about it and talk about it. And, you know, he came up with the line, is he the great I was or the great I am? <laughs> what do you think? He's not the great I was. You know, he didn't stop doing these things. It's just that if we're living a certain way with the Lord and we're not seeing these things happen, it's easy for us to assume, well, maybe he just doesn't do that anymore. But we would say, don't buy into that lie because that's exactly what the devil would want you to believe. And, you know, he prayed for people for months and months and months, and he started preaching about it because the Lord told him to, and half the people in the church he was in left because they were taught that that doesn't happen anymore, that it's, it's a, a real demonic thing that, that somehow people believe that after the, the apostles died, the Holy Spirit stopped operating the way he did in the Bible, and we don't believe that. We can't justify that. It's not defensible in the Bible. Um, but again, if, if you were walking in a certain way with the Lord where you weren't seeing it happen, that could be an easy way out to say, well, I guess he just doesn't do that anymore. Can you agree with me and say that's not true? <laughs> that the Lord still heals today and that we can't figure it out. His ways are above our ways. We don't always know why it happens, why it doesn't happen. We try to, you know, like I said, we, we, we come up with understanding of what, what the word says and we'll look at that tonight. But really without that power being demonstrated, it's, it's, we're missing a big piece of the gospel. And he went, like I said, I think it was a year praying for people and nobody got healed and half the church left. And then one day he gets a call and it's one of the people in his church and he said, can you please come over and pray for my wife because she's really sick and I just got a new job and I can't, I can't stay home and take care of her. And, 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 you know, John Wimber was like so discouraged because he hadn't been praying, hadn't been seeing any results. And he goes over to the house and he didn't really have a lot of faith to pray for her. And he walks in, and the husband leads uh, John into the back bedroom where she was. And he's a funny guy. He had been an entertainer, a musician, and a singer. And, uh, you know, he, he had a funny way about him. And he, and he said, boy, I mean, this lady was really sick. He said, you would not let anybody see her in the condition she was in in, in the back bedroom. And he just said this, like, really quick prayer. With, without any faith, and this is after a year of praying for people, like, I don't know what he said, maybe a thousand people, and hadn't seen any results, but he still had the faith to keep trying, and he just turned to walk out and didn't even really think anything would happen, and he sees the husband looking at his wife over John Wimber's shoulder, and she's getting up out of bed, and she got completely healed, and he was totally shocked, <laughs> right, and that started this amazing long run of people getting healed and signs and wonders and miracles that went all over the world. And ironically, he died of cancer after having seen many people healed of cancer. He had a son die of cancer while he was praying for other people. And, you know, like if we just think everything's going to fit in a nice, neat little box, that's not how it works. 
It, it, it just doesn't work that way. We're in a war. There's casualties of war. You, you can't come to the conclusion that if it didn't work this time, it doesn't work. That's a stronghold of unbelief. And, and that's not the truth that sets you free. The truth is we're going to live for Christ every day. We're going to ask him to transform us into his image with ever-increasing glory. And historians that don't even believe that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, will tell you that healing was the main thing that marked out his ministry. <laughs> Wherever he went, people got healed. That's what happens. I'm the God that gives you life and more abundantly, not the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's a natural result of being with God. So we can believe for this and not I don't want to say not get frustrated because it is frustrating to deal with pain and when you've been dealing with something for a long time and people are agreeing with you and believing with you. But, but keep on pressing in is the best thing I can tell you, right? When you're in battle and the enemy's attacking you, you can't say, time out, I need a day off. They don't do that, do they? But you stand firm and you keep fighting. And when you've done all to stand, you stand some more, right? All right, sorry for pointing at you. That's rude. <laughs> I, uh, I chose this verse, uh, Psalm 144.1, for uh, the text tonight because we are called to lay hands on the sick, right? And David was this amazing uh, man of multiple talents and multiple different titles that he had. He was a worshiper and he was a warrior. He was a king. He was a prophet. If you ever get a chance to read Psalm 22, it's a description of the crucifixion 700 years before it happened. He's describing the crucifixion. So... He had a lot of talents, and he also had a really big stronghold of sin in his life, didn't he? He couldn't control his uh, sexual appetite. And it brought him down, and it brought the country down. But, you know, God still said he's a man after my own heart because he was after God's heart, right? And he says this, he teaches my hands to war, and we think that could mean that he's a warrior, and he was using the slingshot, and that's how he took down Goliath. But if you ever get a chance to hear Dutch Sheets teach on this particular topic about Judah, and what Judah means, most of you would probably say Judah means what? Praise. Praise, right? We all know that, right? And that's because the word implies a lifting of the hands. And we praise when we lift the hands, our hands. But he says, Dutch Sheets does, uh, and he was president of you know, Christ for the Nation, so he's got the Greek and the Hebrew to back it up, that it's an extending of the hands. It's not just lifting of the hands. And when he used his weapon, that was an extension of the hand, Right? That's, that's a weapon that was going out. You trained my hands for war. If you ever read the Old Testament, you might be surprised when it says, and they could use their left hand and their right hand equally well. Did you ever wonder about that? I was like, well, where, what's that coming from? Well, when you were in a battle and you've been using your right hand for a while, it gets tired. So you have to switch over to your left, but if you don't ever practice with that hand, you're going to have a problem. You're dead. <laughs> so they had to be good at both to, you know, because the, the battles would just go on endlessly. What about when he was playing his harp? How about that as an extension of the hand? How about the prophecy that came forth on Sunday night that people would get healed during worship? And we've been seeing that happen for years, right? Like, how does that happen? It's not actually laying on of the hands, but it's through the use of people's hands and sometimes praying for people. It's sovereign. It's the Lord. It's an atmosphere. And when he's welcomed, he comes. And when he comes, you get healed. That's how that works, right? So it doesn't have to be a laying out of the hands, but often it is the use of our hands that extends his power in, in the earth because we're considered his body. And if he was praying for people and he was touching people, we're supposed to touch people. So look at your hands and say, these are weapons of mass destruction against the enemy's kingdom. Use them, Lord, for your glory. And then we all remember when, when uh, David, when we first meet him in 1 Samuel 17, 16, 17, and there was a war going on, and Goliath was calling out Israel as cowards, and uh, he goes down and he kills Goliath, and then Saul calls for him, and he meets him, and then not long after that, Saul is being harassed by an evil spirit, right? You all know this part? And instead of calling for a psychiatrist to give him medication, they call for a psalmist, to come and so maybe we could find some anointed singer that will drive out, excuse me, this demonic spirit from the king. What's that about? 
It's an extending of the hands in a different way. He played the harp, and when that anointing came in the room, what did it do? It broke the yoke of oppression. So we're on good ground when we say that worship and healing are connected and related to each other. I, I think we're tempted to say that the condition of the person who's praying has a lot to do with whether or not the person gets healed or not, but that's not always true either. And, and it's not always true that the person who's receiving the prayer has a lot of faith to, to get healed. God doesn't just fit in a box that way, but I would say that the more we are aligned before we pray, the better the immune system is for that person to get healed. It, that's my personal opinion. That as, as I spend more time in the Word and more time praying and less time listening to the things of the world, right? And if you're working an outside job, you can't avoid that. You have to listen sometimes for your job. It requires you to, but you need to offset that with worship time, with separation time. And, you know, we, we have a prayer ministry team here for years now. We've been doing that. We have Anna sitting right on the front row here is going to get their healing room started again, where once a month we'll, we'll be inviting people in. And we want the people that are on the prayer ministry team to be thinking about that during the week, right? That, man, Sunday I get a chance to be up at the altar and I get to pray for somebody and I'm going to see somebody healed. That's an expectation, right? But, I mean, like, it's not just, oh, no, I'm on the prayer ministry team. I can't go get a bagel and coffee today, right? It's like, no, no, I'm waiting to do this because I'm expecting to see people's lives changed. And I don't have a formula to give you other than what we're going to read in the Word, but there's that John Wimber desire, like, when do we get to do the stuff? When do we get it to, to go out there and practice what we're reading about and not just talk about it, but actually do it? God rewards that, right? That's in Hebrews 11. This is without faith, it's impossible to please God because those who come to God have to believe that he is and that he's what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How many want to be rewarded? for being diligent seekers. Yeah, that's all of us, and that's why you guys are hungry, and that's why you come out. And I'm not meaning to shame anybody who doesn't come out in midweek, that's fine if you're home, but it still applies that when I take this seriously, better things happen. It's, it's a kingdom operation. It's not something you can be casual about. And if you ever hear Trisha talk about um, her early training with Sister Celeste, there was nothing casual about the way she was trained. And, and that's awesome, and, and that's how it should be. We should not think there's a decaf version of Christianity. We don't want to say, Lord, if it's your will, heal this person. We go into that prayer with the confidence of knowing that you're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you, and you don't punish people, and you don't say, well, maybe God's trying to teach me a lesson, and he gave me this sickness. But we've heard people say that. And you, you really have to think hard about your theology if, if you think that's part of God's character because we don't believe it is. You look at the Old Testament, things were different. Jesus came and he took the sickness to the cross. And, and part of our redemption is sickness was taken to the cross. That curse was broken. And by his stripes, we were and are healed. Right? You believe that? Good for you. Okay. And then as far as the hands go, verse 6, 17 in Mark 16, he says, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Come on, say it with me. They will lay hands on the sick, and maybe they will recover. No, and they will recover, right? He told them to go out two by two, and, and whatever house you go in, when you go in the house, heal the, the, the sick that are there. He didn't even say pray for them. He said heal the sick that are there. So wait, mean that sounds a little pompous, like you think all of a sudden that you're the healer. Well, that was Jesus who said that. When you go, heal the sick. And it was a way for them to even believe that this was real. You walk into the house, if they welcome you, heal the sick that are there. And then witness to them, because you're demonstrating that this is real. And that was another great book that John Wimber wrote that I highly recommend, and maybe we'll just do it as one of the Bible studies that we're going to Actually, there's five uh, home groups that are going to be starting that you can do either online or in person. We'll be giving you the details on that Sunday. And that might be one that we do. It's called uh, prayer, I'm sorry, Power Evangelism. And, and it's what John Wimber ended up doing after that one lady got healed. He just started going out on the streets and witnessing to people. And as he was witnessing, the Lord would give him words of knowledge. And it would be over a sickness that they had, and then he would pray for them, and they'd get healed. And guess what? It's easier to get somebody to accept the Lord when they just had a miracle happen in their life. 
And he started studying it out because he was a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. And, and he was in the missions department. And missions is about getting people saved. And he started challenging the students, go in the book of Acts and try to find one time when a miracle happened on the streets where it doesn't also say that people came into the kingdom. It's just a natural. When there's a demonstration of the power, people are drawn to that. And this is what this says. Lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. All of these things are supernatural aspects where we say, God, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. I want to, in your name, cast out demons, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink anything deadly, it won't hurt them. And I'm going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And there's a humility about this, in my opinion. Randy Clark is known also as a, as a strong um, prayer minister. And he came up under the John Wimber model and was trained as a vineyard pastor. Uh, so, you know, he talks about how the, they have these big healing events and people will fly in from all over the world in order to get healed, right? And they're really sick often. And he says, it's amazing when you see people come up out of a wheelchair, but it's really discouraging when you see them leave in the wheelchair because they didn't get healed. And there was that show when I was growing up, I think, I don't remember, it was on Saturday, and it was about sports, and it was the, the uh, something of victory and the agony of defeat. I can't remember it, but the agony of defeat was the part he was making. Thrill, there you go, we're, we're tracking, thanks, Marianne. Thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, and he's like, is it my fault, Lord? Like, how come these people flew all over here? They had the faith to come here, and yet they're still leaving in the wheelchair. And it's, that's what I mean by the, the humbling piece of this is you're not going to know all the answers to all that, but will you walk by faith? When I come back to the earth, will I find faith? Or is it going to be based on you thinking you get a gold star if you do something right? No, we do what soldiers do. We, we try to take out the enemy. We don't always win, but we're going to keep on doing it. And the more you can build up you know, your spiritual muscles, uh, the better. I like to think of it like the immune system, right? Because that is our greatest weapon against any attack that comes against us, spiritually for sure, but even in the natural. And boy, like how much have we been hearing about the immune system for the last 18 months? So that would mean you're really careful about what you let in, in your mind and in your eyes and in your ears and what you let out of your mouth, right? It's not legalism. It's just understanding warfare. And if I'm constantly filling myself up with the word, that's what's going to come out. You leak whatever you're putting in. And if you're you know, walking by faith and not by sight and, and really studying out, there's so many scriptures about healing and your faith has made you whole, right? Not your doubt, not your unbelief, not your questioning. It's your faith that makes you whole. And uh, we'll look at a few of those. Romans 8. If the, yeah, sure. Give her a mic. <laughs> looking up the scripture that uh, my husband just quoted where it says, um, I, I, I can't say here. Hold on a second. Um, where they shall lay, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And I just looked it up. The word recover, just to look up. And, it, and one of the definitions is to have possession of the mind. So, you know, like what you're saying is if, if we're not meditating on the word too, and also like Chuck says, have that mind skin we shifted, you know, if you're constantly just sitting there, you know, we all do it. I'm so sick. I feel so sick. I feel so sick. Well, guess what? You're going to keep seeing me getting sick. Right. And so, but to have possession of the mind, what, what do we have possession of the mind of? Well, the word and what it says and, and, you know, and healing and deliverance. But I just thought that was really interesting that that word recover means to have possession of the mind. So anyway. And take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, right? And every time he tries to lie and say, God doesn't love you, God's not going to heal you, you're going to be just like, you know, if you know the story of Mickey Mantle, every man in his family died in their, I guess it was early 40s. And he started partying young, figuring, why bother? Because every, everybody in my family dies. And he ends up becoming a Christian later in life and says, boy, I sure wish I had become a Christian earlier. I wouldn't have had this death wish on me because now I know the power of God. It was other players in the Yankee system that actually led him to the Lord. Um, so, right, I mean, God doesn't care when you come in. He wants you to come in the sooner the better for you. And, and if you wait, you know, the only one that gets hurt for that is you. <laughs> But I like this whole picture, too, like, like what Trisha's saying. It's not just physical healing as great as that is, 
right? Like the lepers that got healed. And, you know, that's a really emotional one because we've been understanding more than ever about isolation in America and around the world with, with COVID and people having to work from home. And I'm told, I don't know the statistics specifically, but that divorce rate is much higher now because people were forced to stay home and have to see their husband and wife all day long. And that, that didn't result in good outcomes for people and be with their kids, you know, trying to do all of, all of that at home. And, but isolation, forget about that part, but the isolation piece, just whatever's in you is going to come out when you're alone. It just leaks out up to the surface. So if it's the word and it's optimism and it's faith, that's awesome. If it's not, that's okay. God will heal your mind as you devote yourself to him and, and as you ask Holy Spirit to come in. And that's what this says in Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, does it dwell in you? Then this is the same spirit that was hovering over the earth in Genesis that, that brought chaos to a halt and brought the order of God's word. That's the same spirit in you. That's what it says. The same spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and it does. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That's this physical peace that we're in right now. Through his spirit who dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit seems to be the container of the power of God working in us. And Jesus actually said, it's good if I go away because if I go away, the comforter will come. And then you will have that presence and you'll be the temple of the Lord. And, you know, we were, we were on, I was on a call today with a bunch of Wall Street people and they actually talked about this chapter in the Bible, John chapter 13, when Jesus washes the feet. And, you know, Wall Street's not known for servant leadership. <laughs> if, you, if you remember that movie where it talks about greed is good, right? Like, that's what it's known for. Mammon and love of, of money and, and just like a dominant kind of management style. It's, it's really not typically known as servant leadership. But when you do it, well and you understand what Jesus meant I didn't come to be served I've come to serve then you read a book like uh, good to great and the best form of leadership that the world without reading the Bible said the top of the five types of leadership is servant leadership and they were embarrassed to call it servant leadership because it seemed weak so they said level five leadership as opposed to level one we don't have to be embarrassed about it but there's a, a humility about it. That's the thing. Like if you've ever been a waitress or a waiter or if you, you've ever had one of those more menial jobs, and I don't think it's menial personally, but that's how the world looks at it. If, if you're working at a car wash, try, drying off cars, like, and the people that have a nice car drive through, somehow they think they can be demeaning to you and, the, and they've earned the right to do that. And the Lord is saying, no, that's not how it works. We go down and we serve. And that includes praying for people that look like they're in really bad shape. And you don't say, well, okay, I'll do the colds, but I don't want to work on somebody in a wheelchair because it's going to make me look bad. Like, what? That's not how we do this. It's like, if I have faith to believe for a cold, I have faith to believe for the wheelchair. And, and even if I don't see it happen immediately, that doesn't mean nothing's happening. But I'm going to just keep on doing it. I'm going to be obedient to what the Lord told me to do. If I lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. So I'm going to keep doing that. Obviously, always ask permission before you lay hands on somebody. Because if they're from Patterson, you might get hit back. <laughs> He gives life to your mortal body. That's the part that gets sick. And you've heard me talk about it, but I'm going to keep talking about it. It started in the garden. It started in Genesis. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did he say? The devil said, you won't die. Did God say, if you eat from that tree that you'll die? You're not going to die. And did they die? No. But death came in the garden. And once death came in the garden, the wages of sin is, and sickness is a form of that, what consumption that, that's, that's taking our body down over time, right? Everything that's certain is death and taxes. The two things you can rely on, that's what the world would say. But wait a minute. No, with God, we have an abundant life. So we can be effective. Like my friend Doris Wagner, 89 years old. We were just with her in Pennsylvania. She's been on the road for four months doing, doing events, doing deliverance conferences. One leg. <laughs> she had a leg amputated. Doesn't slow her down. She's an amazing woman. And I don't know about you, but that really encourages me that we can be effective for the Lord for the rest of our lives. 
And I would think you even write better books as you get older because you've got more wisdom, right? So there's a way that God can use you as an officer in his army to fight the, the kingdom of darkness that's in this earth. And obviously healing is one of them. All right, now I, uh, I already touched on this a little bit. In John 5, I, I just said God doesn't use sickness to punish us. Anybody here grow up in a home? Uh, this, is, this is my example. My mom was a great lady, but if, if we were having an argument about something or I was giving her a hard time and I ran out of the room and I stubbed my toe on the door on the way out, what did she say? God punished you. See, when you disrespect me, right? And if you have that happen a thousand times, like you really believe God wants to punish you because you're a kid. Well, we're not in that church anymore, okay? We don't believe that God punishes us. When we step outside and we're disobedient, we suffer the consequences of what happens, right? Obedience gets the blessing. Disobedience brings a lack of protection. And when you're outside the blessing, that's what happens. You, you stub your toe and a lot more than that and, and a lot worse. But we really better be careful that we are taking every thought captive and we don't project onto God things that the devil is responsible for. And you'll hear a lot of language that sounds good, I guess, to some people like, oh, well, I guess God just needed another angel and that's why he took her home. Careful. I don't know how you back that one up theologically. I can't find that in scripture. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Do people die prematurely? Absolutely. But does, is that God's will and God's plan? No, we're in a war. Could he have stopped it? Well, there you go again. There's another thing. Well, why does he allow this to happen? What did he allow? He allowed Adam and Eve to have free will. And he said, if you're obedient, you get the blessing. If you're not, a whole truckload of problems is going to come. And we're still living that. But on this side of the cross and this side of the resurrection, we have all these tools. The Holy Spirit, number one, and the word of God together, we could we can offset that natural tendency to sin and fight it. And, you know, some people clearly have a gift for healing, but we're all called to pray for the sick. That's how it works with all the gifts. But I just said there, he doesn't use sickness to punish us. That would be like you trying to teach your child about the stove and saying, turning on the flame and putting their hand on the stove and just saying, don't ever do this. You'd get locked up for that. And God's not getting locked up. He loves us. Verse 19 in John 5 says, the truth is that the son does nothing on his own. All the actions are led by the father. The son watches the father closely and then mimics the work of the father. So if that's what Jesus does, what should we do? Right? We should do the same thing. If we're about to do something and we're not sure, we'd say, well, would, would, would God the father be doing this right now? Would he be laying a bet on, you know, the giants this Sunday or, or watching pornography or, or a lot of things that men get caught up in, like God the Father's not watching pornography, I can tell you that. So Jesus never saw him do that. <laughs> and that's not meant to be condemning, it's just an easy thing that you could think about in your mind. Like, th uh, think on these things, not playing the lottery. That wasn't on the list. <laughs> James 5, anyone among you sick? If I ask that tonight, I know, I know the answer is yes. I know there's people that are sick here. And... We want to pray, right? Because that's the next thing. It doesn't say, is anyone sick? Call a doctor. It doesn't. And I'm not against doctors, right? That's fine. But that's not what this says in James chapter 5. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So there is a laying on of hands again. You take out the anointing oil and you put it on there and it's a contact point. We're the body of Christ, so we're making a contact point with that person with permission. You know, you don't just lay hands on them, but with permission. And now you're in agreement. And, and as there's something about that agreement, when two or, or more are gathered in his name, which you are when you're praying for somebody, he's there. He's with us. If the person doesn't get immediately healed, it doesn't mean Jesus is weak. There's a lot of reasons, right? Remember when the apostle said, Jesus... This man, was, he's been blind. Was it him or his parents that sinned? That's another way that our brain just gets cranked in the wrong direction. What did he say? Neither one. It's for the glory of God. Now, like, really? You're going to make your, you're going to get glory out of that? Well, look, we're in a war. <laughs> that wasn't God's idea that we'd be in a war. It wasn't his idea that we have death. 
but we do. So now that we do, it's up to us to be those intermediaries, the, the conduit of his presence. And I think you could argue the same point with Lazarus, right? Oh, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus gave a very similar answer, right? God's going to be glorified. He told the disciples, it's, it's good that we weren't there. And they're like, what do you mean? How could that be good? Well, look, that was a week before the actual crucifixion. When you study it out, that's right before the upper room and, and washing of the feet that's in John like 9, 10, 11 is all in that area. And he was basically projecting ahead a week the resurrection, his own resurrection. When Lazarus came alive, that was a picture for them to all know that he was going to come alive later. So it was for God's glory. Because that same spirit we just read that raised Jesus from the dead is in Zandy Connor right now. Giving life to your mortal being. The same spirit. We can tap into that. All right, so we anoint, I'm sorry, James said, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, not the prayer of unbelief, will make them well. The prayer of faith. And I've said it enough, but I'll say it again. The opposite of faith is not fear. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Fear is a result of unbelief. And that's a hard one, right? It's like our logic can just get so much in the way and we can have so many layers of strongholds of unbelief in our, in our minds that we need that weapon to destroy that stronghold. We need the weapon of God to destroy it. And it doesn't mean to stop being logical. You can be a logical person and still believe by faith, but sometimes it gets in the way. Too much education. Too many people have gone away to seminary and come back as unbelievers because they had their faith talked out of them in college by these smart unbelievers <laughs> who were masquerading as Christians. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Thank you, Lord. I believe it. Is anyone among you sick? Call the elders, get the oil, anoint them, pray. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now, I already told you the story of John Wimber, the first person that got prayed. He didn't have any faith. He went in there because it was his job. He was the pastor. They called and said, look, can you come over and pray for my wife? He didn't even want to go. So God will still show up, right? He'll still show up and show off often in ways that we don't expect. But this clearly is, is a good way to think about it. That if I, if I knew that it was going to be my turn to be on the on the prayer team on Sunday. I don't work up. I, I don't like, come on, Lord, really work through me today. It's more the opposite of just kind of releasing any, uh, what, like striving on my part to try to do it better, but to just be in that zone and say, Lord, give me the faith to believe when that person comes up for prayer, not to let my intellect get in the way and try to figure it all out, but just to have the faith to believe you that they're going to be healed. Amen? That's a good one. But look what he says next in verse 15 of James 5. He says, and if that man that got prayed for has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So it isn't just the healing. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So something about confessing our sins to one another clears the plate and allows us to be healed. And then you could get into this whole idea of what we would say, what psychosomatic illness is. You know, everybody know what I'm talking about now? That stress inside of us, does that make you healthier or sicker? Nobody knows. Stress is not good, right? Stress is going to take you down, not lift you up. So what, you know, there could be legitimate reasons that you're stressing out, but a lot of times it's just not taking our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And we start playing all these what-if games. And what if this happens? What if that happens? And then we get ourselves all worked up. And that's not good for your immune system. Even in the natural, it's not good. But especially in the spiritual realm. And then it says the effective, fervent prayer. So confess your trespasses one to another. Can I just say this? We're in community here. We're all Christians. We're all part of a church. And we need to tap into the power of this community. Because we all bring something different to the table. And we need each other. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor of the church, right? Because, of, any, of course, a pastor would say that. But I'm talking about the spiritual principle of being in fellowship, being assembled together with other believers. Assembled means you're constructing something. And that when one part's missing, the construction's not, not done right. One pastor said, have you ever tried to make a bike on Christmas Eve for your kids and you end up with 25 extra parts? It's like, 
it's assembled, but it's not assembled properly, right? So it really didn't get assembled properly. But when we're all together and we communicate with each other and we're praying for one another and, you know, often it's just that, like, un unexpected thing somebody says to you and, and it's like, oh, man, that was so important for me to hear that, right? When, but, but just because we're together. I'm not disagreeing that it's okay to watch from home, but not completely, not 100% of the time. We, we need to be together. And then he said, the effectual, I'm sorry, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Ah, oh, this one gets me. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's one version. Another one said, a man just like us. So me and Dave and Tim here all standing here saying, he's a man just like us, Elijah? And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Well, he's a man just like me and just like you. So why should we expect anything different than what he got uh, as a great prophet? So, wow, that's challenging, isn't it? But I could tell you this. If you're never praying for anybody, it's pretty hard to develop those muscles, those faith muscles. You exercise them, and through the use of those muscles, they get stronger. And your faith grows. Not in you. Your faith grows in God. Right? We don't want to have faith in ourselves. All right. So um, I'm going to stick on this part for a minute about the assembling together of the body and the power that's among us when we're together. And why I even asked you to come up to the altar in the beginning uh, while we were worshiping and to pray for one another because you just can't tie God's hands. You don't know how he's going to move. But when we're together, there's, there's a corporate anointing. That, that, that brings extra strength. And it, it's similar to the Trinity, right? It's similar to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are in relationship with each other, so we are to be in relationship with each other. The Father loves the Son and doesn't hide his actions. He shows him everything. This is John 5.20. He shows Jesus everything, and the things not yet revealed by the Father will dumbfound you, meaning that we're in this relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as things get revealed to you, they're, they're exceedingly abundantly above what we thought or imagined, right? That's why it's amazing. We're, we're awestruck by the things that God can do that we don't always think he can do because we limit him. The Father can give life to those who are dead. Isn't that great? Come on, that's John 5, 21. The Father can give life to those who are dead, and in the same way, the Son can give the gift of life to those he chooses. So can we just stop for a minute right now and just pray for people? If you're, if you're dealing with a physical illness, could you raise your hand? And let's just stand on this verse right now. There's one here. Yes, we pray for you. Yes, Zandy in the back. Anybody else here? So could you stretch your hand towards people who have their hands up? And can we just stand on this verse? The Father can give life to those who are dead, and in the same way, the Son can give the gift of life to those he chooses. And Lord, we say it's that healthy life. It's that abundant life. We just say reverse the, the causes of the sickness in the people whose hands are up. They're your children. You said healing is the children's bread. Lord, this is not something that we have to beg you for. It's something that you want to do for us. You, you hung on that cross to purchase this healing. And, and we receive it now as that gift that you've given us. And help us in our unbelief. And help us to believe you for your power to be exercised and to move in the lives of your children. We're your children. You love us. You take good care of us. How much more, you said, will your Father who loves you give good gifts through the Holy Spirit that's working inside of us. So Lord, we just speak that now over your people and anyone who's watching now. Father, we ask you, move mightily in their lives that they would walk in the fullness and healing that we see right here. The Son can give the gift of life to those he chooses. Lord, we thank you that you choose to give us the gift of life tonight. In Jesus' name. All right, good, thank you. Um, back to the stress points. And David and this idea that the Lord trains my hands for war. Um, I can't even tell you how many times when I've started to get in the wrong mindset, just going and grabbing the guitar and playing kind of shifts the atmosphere. So you can just start playing, you know, worship music. But there's something about it for me, obviously, as a musician, that I've been doing it for so long, that uh, it just really works quickly to, to reverse the wrong kind of thinking. And the lyrics are often so beautiful and put to music, you know, scripture put to music, 
it just touches a very different part of our heart. It's not our mind. It's some other part of our soul that needs to be refreshed and, and restored because we get caught up in, in, in the world. And David said, look, I sought the Lord. He heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Wow, what a promise that is. You can hold on to that one. And if you know anything about this particular Psalm 34, it's not at a good time in his life. As often you'll see little subtitles on the Psalms, and this was what he had just gotten kicked out of the city for acting like an insane man, remember? So King Saul was after him. The enemy didn't want him. And yet he says, I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from my fears. He didn't, his situation hadn't changed. He was still in a mess, but he, but he wasn't afraid anymore. He had delivered a deliverance right outside the gate of Abimelech, right? And I quote this one often. I sought the Lord, he heard me, and delivered me from my fears. So anybody dealing with COVID fears, anybody dealing with fear of losing your job because you're not getting the vaccination or whatever else is going on right now, we just speak this over you. You seek the Lord, he'll hear you, and he'll deliver you from your fears. Do not be anxious about anything, it says in Philippians 4, 6. <laughs> That's a hard one, isn't it? But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So that we bind anxiety right now. We are not going to be bound by fear. You haven't given us a spirit of fear. You've given us power and love and a sound mind. So help us, Lord, to be refreshed and renewed in that thinking that you give us. We will think on these things, whatever is pure and holy and righteous, not what the world is trying to feed us. Luke 21, 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Selah. Watch how much time you spend watching the political news and the different cable channels. My God, it seems like it's addictive to people. And, and it's not real redemptive. It's good to know what's going on, but if you could find a source that's somewhat neutral, not easy, I get it, it's not easy, but try to avoid all of the inflammatory language that's around it. Uh, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of the things which are coming on the earth. Like, wow, the sky is falling and you could get yourself worked up into such a frenzy and forget that as a Christian, we win. <laughs> and look, if you ever study the early church, I mean, the, their culture was a thousand times worse than the one that we're living in right now, okay? They didn't have a dollar bill in their pocket that said, in God we trust. So you might think it's, we've gone the wrong direction, and I would agree, but it's nothing like Rome, okay? There were no Miranda rights in Rome. If you got arrested, you got crucified. No trial, no lawyer, no public defender. You, don't even know, what, you know what I mean by Miranda rights. You're, it's, a, it's a miracle that we are considered innocent until proven guilty, they don't do that in China. They're not doing that in Russia. This is the only country that put that right into the law, that you're, you're going to be assumed innocent. Even if it looks really bad, you have to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like, wow, that's Christian, okay? That's, that's the, the biblical root system of our country. And we really should be praying hard. And I know a lot of you do watch Dutch Sheets, and you're, you're familiar with the way we should be praying for our country right now. But, man... I'm not going to get bound up and caught in fear into all the things that could happen. I'm standing on the truth of God's word because I want a strong immune system. And Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will lift you up. My burden is easy, right? That's what he said. Don't, don't get caught up in, in this, uh, I don't know, what, there's so many things you could call it, but really it's money. It's driven by money because the news organizations make more off of trauma and pain than off of good news. So if they're constantly poking at you, breaking news, breaking, well, every story is called breaking news. <laughs> so it's really not breaking, is it? So what is koinonia? I'm sure a lot of you know this, right? You know the Greek word koinonia. What would you say? Fellowship. This is talking about community, communion. It's, it's a really powerful spiritual principle of being in a family, and not a dysfunctional family, but a healthy family that is supporting one another and uplifting one another. And I really think, you know, COVID should be a reason to look back on this and say, yes, being denied the ability to be together with the other believers and assemble with other believers showed me how important it is to be together, not just online. 
I'm going to try to make that case. It also says the share which one has in anything, a participation, a fellowship of intimacy, right? So you'll, you'll think about maybe Christmas time when the kids come up and they do the Christmas play and you're sitting back and thinking, reflecting back on the year when you were in children's ministry and, and you taught this kid or you led somebody to the Lord or here at the deaconry there was 25 kids that got saved in summer camp this year pretty cool. Somebody should be hooting and hollering about that. I didn't get saved as a kid. That was amazing, right? So, so even though you might have been the chef and you did not get to meet that kid, you participated in that. That's the community. That's the koinonia of it. And then you know, the right hand as a sign and pledge of fellowship. So that was another piece of this was the integrity of the relationship. I'm giving you my word. We're not just casual friends. We're part of a community together. And if you know about the uh, Navy SEALs, that's the main tenet of the Navy SEALs is we will never leave you on the battlefield. God bless you. And uh, we got your back. And if you won't have my back, you can't be in the SEALs, right? Like that's the main thing. We always are considering the other person, not just ourselves. I'll skip forward. I'm going to go through this quickly, but it's a really, I think it's an amazing analogy of a worldly guy, Malcolm Gladwell, at least when he wrote it, he wasn't a Christian. Um, I think he might have become a Christian since then. Best-selling New York Times, best-selling author, writes as a psychiatrist and is a brilliant writer. And this was a book called Outliers. And he talked about a little town in Pennsylvania, not that far from here, actually, called Rosetto. And it was a group of Italian immigrants that moved from Italy in a town called Rosetto in Italy, moved to the backside of a mountain not far from Bethlehem, and they were mining, and, and they just had their own little community back there, and basically nobody even knew about them. They just stayed among themselves. So these doctors show up in Bethlehem, I think it was Bethlehem, for a medical conference, and over a conversation one night, two of the doctors, one of them says this, uh, I've been practicing here for 17 years, and I get patients from all over, and I rarely find anyone from Rosetto under the age of 65 with heart disease. So he was observing these people, and everybody that came from Rosetto was healthier than the other people were. And they were all Italian from the same place in Italy, so what would you think? Maybe there's something in their genes, maybe it's their diet, whatever. But it got this guy thinking. And after studying the residents, they took a whole summer, and went into the town, virtually no one under 55 had died of a heart attack or showed any signs of heart disease. For the men over 65, the death rate from heart disease in Rosetta was half that of the rest of the United States. The death rate from all causes, in fact, was 30 to 35% lower than normal, than what would be expected. So something's going on here, don't you think? There was no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime. They didn't have anyone on welfare. These people were dying of old age. That's it. <laughs> Doing something right. And these doctors are thinking like, what is it? Maybe they have a gene they imported from Italy and we can give it to everybody. No, that's not what it was. It wasn't a better diet or exercise. It was a better genetics or something in the atmosphere, quote unquote. It had to be the town itself. And as they walked around town, the doctors, they figured out why the Rosettans visited one another. <laughs> they visited one another. They stopped to chat in Italian and they cooked for one another in their backyards. Really? This is complicated? But are we doing it? Not as not much as we used to. There's medicine in community. There's health and life in living together. And, it, you know, they would watch each other's kids. And if one of your kids stepped out of line, they would call out that kid and they'd let you know. And that kept the crime down. Well, especially with Italians, right? <laughs> the Rosettans had created a powerful, protective social structure. Wow. Think about it. This is the world doing this. How much more the church? That's what we're in right now. That's what you're in right here tonight. You're in a powerful, protective structure. Don't take it lightly. It could be the best, most powerful thing that God gives us is each other. And just to encourage one another and to check in on somebody and pray with them. And, hey, you don't look to be yourself. Is everything okay? And, and they're isolated in their homes. So they're getting, like, shell-shocked from being isolated for so long. 
pray. Come together and pray. The Rosettans have created a powerful, protective social structure capable of insulating them from the pressures of the modern world. And the doctors had to look beyond the individual person's genes or some kind of strength that the person had and understand the culture that he or she was a part of. As they looked at the friends and families in Rosetto, it became clear to these two doctors that the values of the world we inhabit and the people we, we surround ourselves with have a profound effect on who we are. Selah. That's the introduction to the secular book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Not a Christian. He's just pointing to facts about people. And when we live in community together and we respect one another, we have a shared set of values, we prosper, we live longer. We don't die. No suicides, no alcoholism. What? Come on, this can't be that hard. But we're making it hard. Let's not make it hard. And I know Dave is shaking his head because he's going to be talking about uh, Royal Rangers is going to get started up here. We're going to have stuff for the kids to do. And we're, Trisha's got five uh, Bible studies, I don't know, life groups, we would call them, lined up. And, and this is all designed to get us to be together more and spend more time together and, and live life together instead of just seeing each other from a distance. Amen? Or behind a mask, God forbid. <laughs> Matthew 9, 18. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. See, this guy believed in laying out of hands too, didn't he? If you'll just come to my house and lay your hands on my daughter, she's going to be fine. And like, wow, like that's a lot of faith for this guy, right? Just show up. I know she's already dead, but you just come and, and she'll be fine. And then he did. He goes to the ruler's house and he saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion. And he said, go away for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And two weeks ago when we were here, Trisha uh, talked about how she and another uh, one of our ministers at the time went and prayed at a hospital out in Pennsylvania. And same thing happened. The nurse was like, oh, that doesn't work. You can't pray. Don't do that. And Trisha's was like, yeah, go take a coffee break. We want to pray for this, this guy. And he was dying. They were, they were going to take him off, right, the next day. They were going to take him off life support. They prayed for him, and he was home the next day. Right? Like, wow. I don't care if they're laughing at me. That's not the issue that they're laughing at Jesus right now. He's making a faith statement. He left, but what did he do? When the crowd had been put outside. See, this is a biblical principle. Unbelief in the room will lower the intensity of the power of the prayer. And you're not being critical of somebody. If they're not there, you're not saying that they're less than, but you don't want them in the room with you when you're trying to see this person get healed. Pray that they'll, that they'll build their faith, but for the moment, he makes this decision, puts them all out of the room, takes her by the hand, and the girl, just like the father said, rises up. That's a lot of faith. And then Peter you know, like he's not known necessarily for the guy with the most faith, but uh, he did pretty good here. In, in the book of Acts, he, he really did well. Acts 9.37, Dorcas became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. When Peter arrived, they took him to the upper room. I don't know about you, but that would feel like a pretty big challenge. The person's dead, and they're leaving you to pray for this, this woman and to see if you can raise her back to life. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Does that sound like a faith builder? <laughs> no, right? Weeping widows. Doesn't sound like a big faith builder. So what does he do? Puts them out. That's not critical. That's like, you know, I would like to pray. Can I just have a little time alone in here? And I find it interesting. There's a lot in the little details. He puts them all outside and knelt down and prayed and then it says, turning to the body. So that implies to me that he didn't kneel down and pray right by the dead body right away. He just knelt down and prayed and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And after he had been there long enough, something happened that he turned and looked at the body. Because I would have been thinking he would have been praying right over the body at the time. And, and what the Lord gave him, obviously, was Tabitha arise. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. I mean, Hallelujah. Wow, but what both of those scenes, they put the unbelievers out. The ones who laughed at him, the ones who didn't believe. She's, she's not dead, she's just sleeping, and they laughed at him. It's okay, they can laugh all they want. 
this kid, this lady's coming back to life. This child's coming back to life. That's how we have to take it. And again, I'm going to honor my wife because that's what I watched in her. Like, like faith that, that ignored what the, what the noise was saying and just pushed in and believed for whatever the miracle was. And look, deliverance, I don't know if you remember the book by Peter Harbin about how to become healed through deliverance, but I was reading through that, found it on your bookshelf. It's amazing. Deliverance is one of the greatest forms of healing. It might not be the physical arm, but it's the the wiring of your life, right? And so much when that's crooked, that's going to impact your physical health too, right? So everywhere you look, God wants to straighten that out. Okay, so that, was, that would be the last one. This would be the last one. This is the woman with the issue of blood. Just uh, want to finish with your faith has made you whole. Because there's many times, right, that Jesus said that to people. And we all, I'm sure, have read the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. He turns around, and when he saw her, he says what we should all remember. Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you whole or well. And, and that's what I want to end with tonight, right? Because maybe we could just stand and just, and just stand in agreement that we're not going to allow unbelief to rob our faith, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that we don't yet see. And if I don't yet see my healing, I'm not, I'm not wavering in my faith, right? It says about Abraham, he staggered not in unbelief, right? He believed the promise that God gave him. It wasn't based on what he saw. It, it was based on his faith. So maybe you could just lift your hands to the Lord. We want our faith to make us whole tonight, Lord. We want our faith to make us well. We don't want to be bound by fear and every form of attack of the enemy. We close the door right now to, to those lies that try to creep into our lives. And we say we will take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we will think on your word. We will meditate on worship and, and time alone with you and not allowing all the noise of the culture to, to invade our space and, and get us distracted because we know it's your desire for us to walk in abundance in every area, including our health, including the way we take care of ourselves, how much sleep we get, how much exercise, the way we eat. All of these things contribute, Lord, to that strengthening of our spiritual and physical immune system. So whatever lies that we might believe in about ourselves, whatever destructive behavior patterns that have been controlling us, or we break agreement with those lies right now in Jesus' name, and we will walk in health, and we will walk in that divine, perfect place that you have for us because it's who you are, and you desire for us to walk in wholeness and healing and life in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen.